The Blues have made their way down State Highway 1 and they've hit a fork in the road as they take on the high-flying, unbeaten Chiefs. Flipping a kick inside the 22. It's dangerous! Oh, boom! Distributes and Malala doesn't miss him. Christie takes it to the left. Go! On the line. Well, that's a good spot by referee. Plummer, Clark, Caleb Clark! Stevenson, quick hands, Marawa in for a second. Another brilliant finish from Amuni Marawa. And he get it down, held up as the call. It'll be a goal line dropout. Some great defence from the Chiefs to deny the blue skipper. Look at that, what a sight, what camera work. Clark is there, and he lost it. He's lost it, and that's it. The game is over. Now, a record-breaking start to the season for the Chiefs. Oh, how good. The Chiefs 6-0 and oh, and Kitty Kitty Roar Hamilton. Well, JK is away. He's over in Hong Kong trying to find some more voices of the Corridor. Chiefs down in Palmerston North. We've replaced them with the two Johnsons, Taylor and obviously Tony. Not related. Kirstie's back in the hot seat. Plenty to sink your teeth into, including Goldie's Form 15 of next year. Confused? Don't worry, we've got you back. Let's go. Tēnā koutou katoa, good evening and welcome into the breakdown. Will the Chiefs remain kings of Super Rugby for now? Another week and another injury for the All Blacks. Severis this time around and a season-ending injury for him. And is Dave Rennie heading to the Blues? We will discuss all of that plus so much more. Taylor Johnson is in the house. Tony Johnson, Mills Moliaina. I'm looking at you, TJ, to bring the voce de Corodoro today. <laughs> I don't know what was more exciting. The game in Hamilton... Or Mill's intro. <laughs> I, after an intro like that, I, I can't wait to hear what we've all got to say. Well, I want an honesty call um, from all of you. After six rounds of Super Rugby, before the season started, did anyone predict the Chiefs to be top and the Crusaders and Blues to be fourth and fifth? Anyone? Can we rewind to the first episode of the breakdown of the year? Because I said the Chiefs are going all the way. They've got the best team. They've got the most settled team. So we can clip that back and hopefully one day and say that I said that first because I've been backing them the whole way um, and they've proven me right. Yeah, I think it's fair to say one New Zealand team will, or we would have thought, but I think the way the Chiefs has gone about in 6-0, and um, you would have thought they might have had a sort of hiccup you know, considering they started with the Crusaders, um, but the way they sort of started the competition... Mm. Great way to go into the bye, TJ. Yeah, I looked at the way they lined up in that pre-season game that we did, and I just thought, wow, the depth in this side is phenomenal. Um, and what I really love about them, I think we're seeing the development of an identity of this team under Clayton McMillan, who is very much becoming a, a rising force in New Zealand coaching. I mean, in a game played in difficult conditions, that was all about character, it was about attitude, because they say defence is about attitude, when you have to make a hundred more tackles than your opposition. Mm. Uh, you know, that said so much about this Chiefs team and why they are where they are. Well, this was the big game of the weekend, right? We've been talking about this game for weeks, so let's talk Super Rugby, all thanks to Nurofen, available at Chemist Warehouse. <laughs> Everyone's talking about the form wingers in the competition. Every week we've spoken about Leicester, Whainganuku, we've spoken about Mark Talia, but what about Imoni Narawa after that performance in Hamilton Mills? Severis, gone for the All Blacks, there's a place available. Do we have to start talking about some of these other guys? Oh, I, think, I think so, and Imoni has been doing it for the last sort of two or three weeks now. I mean, the interesting part for me is when it comes to the big games, do these guys sort of stand up? You know, he's been he went over and um, obviously against the Waratahs, it was good the week before that he was, but then this is a huge derby match, you know, do you get up once again for these big ones? Has he done it? Absolutely you start talking. You're putting, you're putting his name amongst those other wingers. Two great finishes. Brilliant. It was like the touchline was an electric fence. He, he just was not going to go over that touchline. But also, a, a lovely shift move, burst up the centre. We've always known that this guy's got extreme talent and we're really with the maturity now we're starting to see it come to fruition it's a heck of a battle line normally in New Zealand we're very strong on the left side of the field the left wingers and the right winger we're going okay who do you slot in there now uh, it's really sad about Sevu Reese. Mm. Um, but Mark Tillier has been lights out Narawa 
comes into the frame. We've still to see uh, Will Jordan, and we know Sean Stevenson can play right wing. Yeah, and Moninato is special. I mean, like, he's played two less games than everyone else and is in the top five for defenders beaten because he's just so electric and he, he just has good vision as well. He spots the right gaps and he knows where to go. So, look, I think he's really exciting, but we're so blessed with so many good wingers here at the moment. Over the last sort of five uh, to eight years, Mills, the Chiefs, they haven't struggled, but they haven't been right at the very top where they've wanted to be under their last two coaches, um, right? What is Clayton McMillan doing that is different? I think they've found a really good balance. I think McKenzie plays a big part because for a number of those years, we sort of, you know, it will be at the year they went to Japan, they've sort of struggled to get that sort of, you know, um, solid... 10. He's not a traditional solid 10 because he, he can go you know, off, sort of, um, off, off the, the game plan, but the thing is they've found a balance in understanding what his game plan, what his game mindset is and then sort of gelling it in within the team. He's got a really good um, you know, a bunch of forwards that have been there for a wee while and they've gone through a lot of hurt you know, when, they, when they lost like eight in a row or something like that. So he's created a culture of that sort of hurt and pain, but also that start, you can't underestimate that start against the Crusaders. They went down there and they absolutely dominated. That just start, they just ignited something in, in, in their confidence and they've just gone on from there. If we take a look at the match stats, the Blues won most of the match stats. TJ, they'll be looking at this one thinking they missed an opportunity here. Are there now serious question marks around the decision making uh, that went on on that field? The ability to finish? From well, the Blues it, as well. Yeah, it's very much the ability to finish because if you look back against the Crusaders, they twice had the ball over the line, didn't score. I think in this game it was three times over the line, didn't score, including a, a really out of character gaffe by Bowden Barrett stepping on the dead ball line. Um, interesting. I talked to Matthew Cooper, who was, you know, being presidential now, was sitting right in the middle of the field. He said he felt like the whole game he was watching the backs of the blue shirts. In other words, they were dominating the attack, but they just didn't find a way through and again you just go down to that that Chiefs defense and and, and again the, the, the Blues have got to start making these chances count they are not out of this by any stretch of the imagination but they've got to start turning opportunities into points yeah and I understand Leon McDonald's frustration as well you see him in the coach's box you know you're slapping the table and getting frustrated because they weren't out coached you know they had a good game plan they won the territory battle they won the position battle they had more visits to the opposition 22 but the players themselves weren't finishing and that's the most frustrating thing for Leon is he's he's giving them the tools that they need but they're just not using them correctly. Dalton also made a startling yeah. admission as a leader to you in the post-match interview as well. Yeah, he, he said, look, I'm going to put my hand up. There's probably some kicks we should have taken. We actually probably should have gone for goal sometimes. And I know, TJ, you got something to say here <laughs> because you say, just because you don't go for the three doesn't mean you've left three points out there. But I, I do know that, you know, it was him versus Sam Kane, right? And uh, particularly around leadership, not just yeah. what they do on the field. And I think Sam Kane led the Chiefs well, you know. They were behind on a lot of the stats, but they didn't ever seem frazzled on the field. You know, the defensively, they were very good. When they were on attack, they looked very structured. So I think, yeah, Dalton, although he put his hand up for that, it is a team effort type of thing too. No, the point I was making is that just because you turn down four shots at goal doesn't mean you've left 12 points out there. Because of the old butterfly effect, isn't it? You, you kick that penalty, it changes the course of the game. They did get some pay out, out of the decisions, yet yeah, maybe they could have. Different day, they would have, you know, Richie McCaw always talked about accumulating points, didn't he? Don't leave empty-handed. Big decision in a tight game like that. Um, but again, that they had other opportunities as well. But it's the balance. I mean, we sat here last week and we spoke about, you know, I mean, this is a massive head-to-head -head battle between these two very good players. And you, you used to see it then, you know, Sam Kane, he's had all the experience in the world to be able to go, OK, well, here's a massive game. This is what I'm going to do. OK, we'll, we'll accumulate points. We'll go from there. We'll have Damien slot up, even if it's 55 metres out, and slot a goal because it's an intense game. Dalton will learn a lot from that in terms of his leadership. He's a great player in, in terms of that, but he needs those sort of runs on the board in terms of his leadership around his team. And you've also got to get the balance right in terms of what his team is going through as well. You know, they're a little bit sort of down in confidence in terms of the finishing. So perhaps that's what they sort of needed. Get them up early, late start. You know, they had a horrid start with the Chiefs scoring early, but get them back into the game and grow that confidence. So if you look at the All Black matchups, uh, first and foremost, we'll look at that Sam Kane, Dalton Papali'i, and what the stats say. But as you said, TJ, the numbers don't tell you the whole story, do they? Did the Chiefs win all the head to head matchups, or is it not as simple as that? No, I think they did win the key matchups for sure. Um, you know, McKinney. Bowden Barrett got better as the game went on. He had a, a horror period there for a while in the first half, 
um, did or didn't make a good start. Damien McKenzie wasn't perfect either, but I'd, I'd say he edged that. Dalton Papali, Sam, Sam Kane. Look, to me, um, Papali's stats are very good for this game, but, but some things aren't told by a stat. And you just talk to the players, and Brad Webber said it after the game, didn't he, that mm. what a, a great presence on the field Sam Kane is in a tight match like this. Him, guys like Brody Retallick, when that physicality is oh so important, there's no one more physical than him. I mean, look at what the stats are saying. Um, the numbers very much favour Dalton Papali, don't they? Rucks visited Taylor. It's nearly double. Tackle success, though. Sam Kane, 100%. Yeah, there's a reason why he's the All Blacks captain and I know lots of people have been criticising him but look, he put out a good performance. Yes, he didn't hit as many rucks as Dalton. Dalton was everywhere on the field but again, we go back to being a little bit more than um, just what's happening on the field, being leaders. Um, so look, I think Sam Kane definitely won that head-to-head -head. but I am going to disagree with TJ. There was one head-to-head -head I think the Blues won and that was front row. Has to be the front yeah. row. I mean, the, blue, the, the Blues were eighth, you know, in scrums. The Chiefs went backwards multiple times. I think Offa and Nepal really stood up. Um, set piece was a huge issue for them. You know, they were last in lineouts and they actually nailed them. Um, so I think, you know, it wasn't all negatives for the Blues. They actually showed a lot of improvement in areas that they wanted to improve. Mills, if you look at the battle at 10, Damien McKenzie outshone Richie Moonga in week one. Fast forward to re week six, and he just did that to Bowden Barrett as well. Is it is easy to say that in a winning team, Damien's yeah. shining, or is he doing so much more than the incumbents? What do you think? I think he is doing, but I think they've got a settled sort of game, you know, awareness that they know what Damien's going to do. The forwards understand if we're getting ourselves into trouble, this is what we kind of fall back into. Damien sits really nicely, you know, when things aren't going right and they've sort of gone backwards, he'll sit in the pocket and he'll kick. Everyone knows that. Two years ago, they wouldn't have. And so they're all on the same page, TJ, as, as yeah. opposed to, you know, the Crusaders, they're struggling. We haven't seen this from the Crusaders before. They're struggling, so are the Blues, you know, in terms of their rhythm. The Chiefs, They've come out of the gates and they are flying because they understand their, their 10, their 9's backing them up and they all understand their game plan. Yeah, two big advances in Damien McKenzie's yeah. game, I think. I think in the early stages the opposition didn't know what he was doing but sometimes some, his teammates didn't either and I think they're, they're in sync a lot more now. And the other thing is his kicking game. Uh, 250-22 so far and he nearly got a couple of more. His kicking game, the length of his kicking game has really improved. So these are a couple of really significant advances that he's made in his game. So should we be looking at Damien McKenzie as a serious option at 10? It's hard because, you know, as we were saying earlier, with the All Blacks, they've really only got one specialist 10 in Richie Moonga because we see Stephen Perifeta and Bowden Barrett floating in between 10 and 15. Um, and, you know, Damien McKenzie's obviously doing the same. But he's been outstanding. Um, and I think the reason is, kind of touching what TJ said, is he's so ad hoc and almost random, for lack of a better word. So every time he has the ball, the opposition actually do does hang back and they give him time because they're not sure what he's going to do. So, yeah, I think uh, he's he's a genuine option at 10. What about Bowden Barrett? There were a couple of comments last night, Mills, about him maybe lacking a bit of confidence, not knowing whether he was playing at 10 or 15. What do the Blues do with him? Do they maybe switch Stephen Petalfetta and Bowden Barrett around for the season? What I mean, would you be doing? Yeah, I would be doing that. I know it worked for them last year, the fact that he was at 10 and Pedal is at, at, at the back. I just, he lacks confidence. You don't see that in a great player like Bowden Barry. He's still great in terms of how he's, he's playing, but he kind of just seems offbeat, a little bit confused about what he's going to actually do. And that's kind of had the ripple effect on the team. So when you say they get into the right zones and you, you know, you're trying to score, well, usually Bowden Barrett is sort of actually stepping up and he's running the cutter because he knows he's a 10. He's played a little bit of fullback, well, quite a bit of fullback now with Moong at, at, at the All Blacks. And I, I, watching him, it just feels like he's now thinking he's a fullback. And so when you're a fullback, you take a little bit more time. You don't sort of, you're not as, as, as assertive in, in that sort of playmaker role. Pedal Fetter's actually taking that on too. Now he's gone a little bit quiet, you know, you know what I mean? Because they're, they're, they're unsure, almost like when we sort of, you know, started that whole, you know, 10 and 15, two playmaker roles. It's now got to the, to, to the point for the Blues, unfortunately, that you kind of feel that for their, for their playmaker and they've lost their sort of direction. So I, I definitely think perhaps it's something they, they need to really consider. Um, in terms of DMAC, I think he is. I, I think he's, he's a 10. Moonga, for me, is still our, our All Black starter. DMAC's a 10, 15. Mm -hmm. So that's an easy slot in, in, in off the bench. I think Bowden now is our fullback. I think Bowden starts at fullback and he becomes a 10 option. And I think that's where he's, he's starting to feel a little bit, oh, you know, what am I actually doing? What do you do with him at the Blues then? If he thinks he's going to be playing 15 for the All Blacks later on in the year, TJ? Yeah, I mean, maybe that's a factor. I thought he got better as the game wore on. 
Definitely. And the other thing I'd say about Bowden Barrett, you know, if you like your stats, well, he, he's got more kicks that have been actually won back, retrieved, than anyone else. So he's working on the variations in his kicking game, and it, it, actually the numbers say they're working reasonably well. Uh, yeah, I, I, I get that. I, I thought uh, the, the, the previous week when Bodie was um, actually off in Melbourne, I thought Stephen Petalfetta ran things really well. He, he, like Richie Maunga, he has the ability to function in traffic. He's not a, a stepper as such. He more glides his way through. Uh, I, I really like it. I think it's something that they could consider doing. I just think it's one of those situations where maybe a little bit more definition of, of, of who, who's what might, might iron... Uh, that, that little issue out. And, and uh, you know, we're halfway through it. There's still plenty of rugby yeah, to be played. I, I in just this think just taking a bit of pressure off him. Like, you know, he's already, don't, you don't even give him the goal kick, and he's kicking well at goal. You know, give, give it to Pedal Fetter. He's a young bug. Let, let him have and let, you know, Bodie sit back and really enjoy playing fullback. Well, let's take a closer look at the impact Damien McKenzie had on the match in Hamilton yesterday with our Musashi power play Mills. We've pulled out some clips of Damien McKenzie and what he was actually doing. Talk us through it. Oh, yeah, this is where, you know, I was talking about before, you know, not conventional, comes back, goes all over the place, everyone's waiting, but Who they know... Away with something, that? <laughs> yeah, something's going to happen. And then, you know, there's an opportunity there. Look how tight... You know those defenders are, there's space out wide, but they understand, OK, well, if he gives it, it's on. And then he's got, you know, Anthony Nano Saturo and the outside backs just, just finishing their role. Again, you know, I come back to, to my point, he's at the back here now, he's got so much time. That's what, what it seems like, so much time, he's, he sizes things up, he's, he's unsure, OK, I'll give it to you here. But look how far they've gotten, you know, since, since he collected the ball, and he was going backwards after a missed bounce. Again, Unsure, looks over the top, there's, there's a bit of space in behind, they come back here, they end up getting a penalty from that, but have a look at the players around him, Taylor. They all understand that he's, he could end up all over the place, but they get on the same page. I think that's the thing, is he's really decisive, like he's going to do something different, but he makes a decision and then they 100% back him each time. And I think because the Chiefs have had the most settled team in Super Rugby for the New Zealand sides, that everyone is getting those connections. You look at the Boos and the Crusaders, there's a lot of chopping and changing, but just looking at that, he's got the ball on the string, you know, at trainings, it looks like they're just having fun out there on the field and on the ground, you know, so I think he's been outstanding and he's a real leader for this team. And it's interesting because when people come back from Japan, they're often Often not as good as they were when they've left and he's actually just come back better you know and playing in that kind of you know they like to say easy cop but he's been awesome that's true he's flipped the switch right uh, we had Bowden Barrett come back and Brody Retallick it took them a little bit of time TJ to settle in and not this guy no no um, and he's very much in the frame now World Cup you'd have to think uh, Maunga Barrett McKenzie You've got some versatility there. I, I tell you what, though, when it comes to those outside backs, yeah. and, and those three are going to impact on who they take as outside backs, yeah. boy, they're going to have some tough decisions to make, and just hopefully the ones that aren't selected are still around next year and maybe make Goldie's future Form 15 that we're going to talk about later. <laughs> we are. We're going to get to that a little bit later on the Form 15, but maybe we should call it the Future 15 yeah. because it's actually the team that could potentially play for the All Blacks next year. There is no doubt this man will be there in some position. Damien McKenzie played 101 games for the Chiefs yesterday. This is him sitting down with his great mate, Anton Leonard-Brown. Big slum. Excited about this one. Thanks for having me at your house, slum. No worries, mate. That Japan move paid off well. A massive congrats on 100 games for the Chiefs. Proud moment for you and your family. Here comes the man of the moment, Jamie McKenzie. Oh, mate, it was, it was a great feeling, pretty special. I moved up here about 10 or so years ago, so to join an elite club and have played 100 games for the Chiefs. And then obviously family and friends over there too, so it's always nice having someone in the crowd. Yes, sorry I couldn't make it over. Um, just flights were a bit too expensive. Yeah, one of my earliest memories of you, mate. It was playing for Christ College. You lead the hucker. <laughs> That's scary, mate. Passionate. That is Passionate. Scary. He's not a big man now, but even smaller back then. McKenzie, McKenzie's running. He's gone straight through them. We're both from down south. How did you find your way up here? Is, is it true that you, you wanted to follow me? Oh, I honestly never thought I'd be up playing for the Chiefs, that's for sure, but good opportunity through Wayne Smith to come up and play and been here ever since, never looked back. It's worked out well yeah, though. It's worked out not, not too bad. It's nice, yeah, it's still no, here it's still he goes. Better. Through the gap, moving to this one. Breaking is McKenzie! Damien McKenzie, brilliant! 
And what makes me the proudest for being a chief is you go through the highs of love, rugby, and oh, brother to brother. McKenzie, the quick throw, Damien McKenzie! We went through a period there where we struggled for quite some time, and winning's a habit, but losing can also be a habit as well. And, and then I guess just the fight from the, not only the players, but the organisation to then rebuild the following couple of years, come out and just get better and better. And I just think that's the fight within the club and within the region. Um, we always had great support. Nagawa looks to slip the puck. Oh! Just out of McKenzie! Oh, what a try that is! Ken Kikasi, like she remember early on, we played a pre-season <laughs> game over Sydney and words from your mouth was that you couldn't kick a slippery sausage off a plate. So you come a long way. It couldn't have got much worse that day. Goal kicking's one of those things, your hero was zero. It goes and over it goes. Talk us through why you smile and you uh, created the, the Damien trademark smiling before you kick and it revolutionised your kicking percentage. Couldn't get any worse from what it was when I first started, so a guy by the name of David Galbraith, DG, a great man, sort of said to me, stop overthinking the kick, so I guess a smile was just a way to, to loosen up and just enjoy the moment, regardless of whether the kick went over or not, just be happy to be there. McKenzie strikes it, and he wins it! Oh, here we go. Yeah, and fellas getting up for it. This is a nice smile you got there. How are you single still? I'm still trying to figure that out. Actually. Yeah. Damien McKenzie, the man of the moment. Just a question, when are you going to give me the tea? I'm, I'm pretty close to getting sacked this year, actually. So. <laughs> when you play your hundy, yeah, and if, we, gonna... if we're winning, and we're not in a position where we need to kick. Nah, from anywhere. Yeah. I want it to be the winning kick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Here's the smile. Here's the kick from McKenzie. Another one. Oh, look at Dom. Oh, yeah. Jeez, we've had some good times, haven't we? No, oh, mate, we've had some fantastic times up here. Chiefs, Waikato, a living stone throw away, Tuesday barbecues, coffee cards. Golf, Tiki. Golf. Damo, my good mate, thank you for all you've done in the Chiefs jersey. When you think of Peace Rugby, you think of Damien McKenzie, the blonde haired boy from Gore, that uh, smiles when he kicks and is an absolute superstar of the game. I can't think of anyone more deserving of, of playing 100 games for the Chiefs and let's hope if the body plays its part, you've got 100 more in you. Because I'd love to see it. Appreciate it. Appreciate Thanks you, on, bro. Cheers, I appreciate bro. you. Back in the day, Mills always had this puff his chest out on the field, but then he always have to run to us boys to have his back, so looking forward to getting in the ring with him and teaching him a lesson. Sometimes he has to talk to Fozzie, or you say, we're not going to pick this guy because he hasn't got that mongrel in him. So I had to sit him aside. I said, bro, if you don't get that mongrel in you, man. But I taught him a couple of things, just power, all about power, speed, bang. But he got there, he got there. Don't worry about my mate, eh? he's breathing quite heavily, he's got a sweat on his head. I know he's an ex professional athlete, but I don't know if he's been going to the gym. Hunger, far out, man. Just under four weeks to go, bro. How yeah. are you feeling, mother? No, I'm feeling good, bro. It's, uh, it's been a long while. Four weeks to go. Uh, the exciting stuff now has just been a grind day the last, the last four weeks, so we're looking forward to sharpening the spoon, bro. Bro, this is so much different to rugby, man. Yeah, oh, bro, I've, I've always had the passion for boxing since I was younger. I remember my old man always used to sit me down and watch Friday night fights with him. But how weird is it that, uh, I know in the past you've seen the, the, the old sort of dudes go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, but these are guys also that you're sort of, you know, for me, watching State of O and watching Rugby League and stuff, you see them on the TV, but now you're kind of <laughs> boxing against them, man. Like, oh, bro, that's, the hard, that's the hardest thing, bro, because like, I'm a Queensland supporter, bro, that, nice. and he was always the guy that yeah. would always buck up the fight. Like, <laughs> get him, get him, yeah. hit him, hit him. <laughs> And then now I'm like looking across the, uh, the press conference the other day and I'm just like, oh, I've got to fight this bloke. So even though we're sort of old and, you know, retired and semi-retired, you still have that competitive edge and, you know, the boys want to want to give it their all. So, no, it's, uh, it's going to be a great night. Nice. And is it part of that desire still from rugby that burns inside you to be the best you can be? Is that part of the reason too? Yeah, 100%, bro. That, that will never go away. Um, I think that's with anything in life that, that we do. Um, we're always trying to, you know, strive to be better and, and trying to grow and trying to learn. And um, 
I, I do that here at boxing. If I, I don't come away from a training session that I haven't learned something, um, then I get pretty, you know, down on myself and try and try and rectify that for the next training session and just learning, learning a whole new sport, learning how to um, change my body because I've always had a, you know, a rugby's body, but you got to sort of trim down a bit and you got to, you know, put a bit more rotational strength and power and whatnot and have a bigger gas engine. You know, we both come from the school of touch. Um, but this is, this is right up there. Next level or? This is right up there with the, the stuff that we used to do for Titch. So for me, it's really important that I, um, that I get some hidings, because that's, like you said, that's where you learn. There's, there's no point coming in here and, and you know, beating up all the corporates or having your way with everybody. Yeah. You need to be put under pressure, because that's how you learn and that's how you grow and that's how you become better at, at something you're trying to do. So, like on Monday for instance, we're up to Auckland um, and, you know, sparred some really, really good top heavyweights in New Zealand. Yeah. And I took a hiding, but, you know, I, I loved it. Bounced it ahead and you still loved it. What yeah, the? it's a weird one, man, because it's like, because I'm sort of not playing rugby anymore, you sort of miss the, I know you're a fullback and you didn't do much. <laughs> you probably missed all the contact, you're like, oh yeah, you yeah, know, you, you make the tackle. Get in there, get you in know? there. That, that's, that's, that's one thing that, um, you know, you're not trying to get hit. When I first started, like, taking boxing seriously, I sort of had a style where I'd come forward and try and, you know, take the punches and, you know, let's go toe to toe, but now, you know, I know people sort of love and hate Mayweather, uh, Money Mayweather, but, you know, that's the key, trying not to get hit, because uh, you can't take too many good shots, because uh, it's not good for the old noggin. That's what I taught him, man. Hey, I'm proud of that, bro. I taught you good. I taught you good, man. Oh, that is so good. Liam Messam in action. Fight for Life is coming April 27. It is all for a good cause as well. He's taking on Justin Hodgins, former Queenslander. But Mills, he said that he needs to get a few hidings. So did he give you one or did you give him a hiding? Let's just put it this way. It was a draw. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay? It was a draw. And I, that's what I did. I, I did teach him how to punch that. You didn't see that at the end. He had plenty of power. Tell us, tell us how it's actually, what it's actually like in there. Is it tricky? Is oh, it hard? Is it man. exhausting? What was it like? It is so, like... He just stood there and did nothing. I was all sort of tensing up. I was sweating. I was like trying to defend myself the whole sort of time. So, and no, no one else is around. There's no, no other 14 other guys that's ready to help you out. So, you. Uh, I've got to take my hat off to these guys because, man, that is a hard thing to be able to get in. And I, I think when I spoke to Liam, he said, mate, you just made that level not to get the phone call. So I'm not expecting any phone calls, and it's all good. Uh, float like a butterfly, sting like a butterfly. <laughs> yeah, I was floating my way out of the ring, mate. <laughs> from what you've just said, it's pretty amazing that Liam Messam has made the transition from professional rugby player to now professional boxer, isn't it? Well, for a start, the guy was born in Blenheim, so that's uh, that's a good that's a good start. No, it's it's terrific, and and fight for life. It's always such a Big, big thing. I, I just think back, brought back memories. I still think the best one out of the lot was uh, Tiro Party and Frank Bunce, and uh, they both went hard at that. That was, that was a. There's been some great ones over the years, but no mess. I good on him. He's uh, boy, he's still looking cut, isn't he? He's, good. he's looking in very good. He's in very good form, and um, man, some of his punches. <laughs> tell you what. That's not a hiding that you want to be getting before. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's some big clashes. Roy Asatasi against uh, Sam Tuitupo. DJ Forbes is in action as well. Uh, and it is rugby against league April 27. And that'll be live on Sky as well. We thought, since we're talking rugby versus league, and there's been all this mm. chat about Joseph Suwali'i, of course, the young rooster star that is going across to Rugby Australia in the next two years. Who would actually make the transition smooth? Of course, it's happened in the past. Brad Thorne, Sonny Bill Williams, uh, Roger Tuivasa-Shek, who's currently um, done it. But who do you think would make that transition from NRL to rugby or the other way around, Taylor? Yeah, I think it's, it's an interesting conversation because I think one is harder to go into. So I do think if you've never played rugby union and you're heading... Um, you know, into it from the NRL. It's difficult. There's so many technical rules, and I think that's why a lot of people enjoy watching the NRL because there's a lot less rules. Um, but in saying that, I think um, someone like Isaiah Papali'i um, would be awesome. He was the Mount Albert Grammar School captain. Um, oh, you've seen the footage right here. Um, won them a top four title. New Zealand schools, and then when he decided to go to the NRL, um, a lot of clubs who were looking to sign him were upset about it. So I think it would be quite easy for him to transition in. 
But equally, like, I wouldn't mind seeing someone like Asafo Almuwa have a go in the NRL. Like, I know Sean Stevenson's name has been thrown around, but even Tamodi Tavatavanawe, like, he's a winger, he's not the fastest winger, but he's got pure brunt force. Seeing him in the NRL, amazing. I'd love to see it. So, like, I know that the debate has... Um, ignited a bit of war of words, which I love. I love the fact that they've done that. I love the fact that, um, you know, there's people piping up about the situation as, you know, union poaching from NRL. But you go to any first 15 game in Auckland, actually anywhere in New Zealand, there are about 12 NRL scouts and all of that. So I don't want to hear any of this, you're stealing it from union because it's the, uh, 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 stealing from NRL, sorry, because it is the other way around. Well, Mills is a scout. So have you poached a few of those rugby league players? Yes. Mills, who would you like to see? First and foremost, I am not a scout. <laughs> I'm just there to watch the good talent of New Zealand come through the grades and stay in rugby. That's all I'm there, there for. But I think if you look at sort of who would transition out, for, for me, I mean, you sort of often look at the, the, the game drivers, you know, the, mm. um, the superstars of the game in rugby league, the sixes and the sevens, you know, you know Nathan Cleary is probably one that sort of stands out, but it's a little bit different, you know, their skill set is, and, and the game management around rugby league is a lot different to, to rugby. So rugby, you know, we just seen it. The first five, Damian McKenzie, look how he controls the game. Mm. In, in league, you've got a little bit more time, but you're taking the ball right, right to the line. You can, you're, you're, you're tactically getting your, your guys around. The kicking aspect, that's huge as well because, you know, they don't kick the ball away unless it's, you know, the last TJ. So yeah. I look at players like that and I, and I just think, I don't know whether they transition well into this unless you're a winger or a Joseph mm. Swali mm. because he has got the skill set. Well, yeah, they've paid $1.6 million for him. I think if New Zealand rugby had $1.6 million to spare, I would rather they spent it keeping three good players in New Zealand for longer or putting it into the, um, the, the structure of the game. I can understand what Australia's done here and it's come off for them already because before the guys even play the game, even on the rugby league shows, they were talking about rugby union. Rugby union has taken so, such a kicking in Australia in recent years. And this is, this is publicity. Terrific. Probably you've, you've got yeah. half your money back in yeah. publicity and it was worth it just to watch Gus Gould throwing <laughs> the toys around who I really enjoy watching, but the hide, as you suggested, to, yeah. to, to think, you know, picking the eyes out of uh, out, out, out of rugby league, I don't think so. <laughs> not, not compared to what's gone over the last few decades. Well, which super rugby side is going to get the services of Joseph Suali'i? Because let's be honest, all the Australian sides need it at the moment, right? If you look at the top six teams, five of those are New Zealand teams. Uh, the Brumbies sit second at the moment, but who will make up the other two positions in the eight? That's the big question. It's basically yeah. a lucky dip, isn't it? Well, yeah, I, I think the, if you, you've got the, the six on there, the Drua are currently in seventh, and they've got, what, three, home more, games? three more home games to play, and, I mean, that's worth ten points for them. <laughs> they, uh, they make the quarterfinals, don't they? Well, I still think they'll have to win one more game away from home. Uh, they can't just do it on, on their home record, but they're a possibility. I still think the Waratahs, I know they're second to bottom at the moment, but I look at that, see, there's too much quality... In, in that team, I, I think they could make a run through and, and get there. Yeah, I, I tend to agree. I mean, you got your, you know, ideally would like our five, you know, New Zealand teams in there. I think the Waratahs, you know, they've got too much quality players. Sort of, the draw for me, um, you know, get, get their sort of spot um, given the home games that they've got. I think possibly it's going to come down to you know that last sort of space that place. The Reds and the Highlanders, unfortunately. You know, I mean, I'd love to see the Highlanders going there, but I think the Highlanders run home is a lot more difficult than what the Reds have. And like, the Reds have sort of been hot and cold, and they've got mm. some quality players there, but I think they could actually be the ones that sort of um, sneak in. Yeah. I think the Rebels have been the most improved side in Australian Super Rugby for a long time. I mean, every time you played them, you'd, you'd get a cricket score. At the moment, you know, they've got some good wins, but they've also lost really narrowly. Like, you know, they played the Hurricanes and only lost, lost by six. You know, they lost to the Force by um, seven. So they've actually been really good. Um, and the connections have been really good for that team as well because they are a team that's been together for a while, so they can actually build on that. So I think the Rebels could get in there, uh, but I'm definitely going the Drua, because I think it's so smart to play in Fiji, because everyone gets their, their gas. As someone who's played in Fiji, yeah. I'm telling you, I was literally, I threw up on the sideline, I was that overheated, so like, it is very hot there, so I can just imagine how hard it is to suck in the big ones over there. Well, they're definitely making Fiji their fortress, aren't they? I asked you earlier, but is it something that Moana Pacifica could look at doing, moving some more games yeah. to the islands? You've obviously got one there in a couple of weeks' time, the first yeah. one for you. Yeah, I, I think... 
ideally that's that's the whole point of the franchise is to actually be there and the reason why they started off in Auckland was because COVID and um, it's where the facilities are you know the real disappointing thing about the islands is that the facilities aren't quite where they're at you know um, the stadium in Nukualofa and Tonga isn't you know um, approved by World Rugby yet because there's a lot of things that need to happen there so I think as much as uh, Moana Pacifica and the management want to take games there they just can't because of the facilities um, but I think yeah I, I think this game coming up um, in a couple of weeks time in up will kind of be quite telling, you know, with the crowd, um, just how the players play as well. Because um, they're not based in, in the islands like yeah. Fiji, so they're, you know, the Fijians are used to the hot weather. You know, it's going to be a tough ask for both one of our speaker players and the opposition. Exactly, yeah. they're playing the Reds as well, so it's a big game for both <laughs> of those two teams. Now, uh, Jeff Wilson is not here, you may or may not have noticed that, but <laughs> he is doing the Form 15 this week, and he changes the rules uh, all the time, doesn't he? It is not a Form 15 this week, it is a Future 15. It is the potential 15 that Scott Robertson, the next All Blacks coach, could name. <coughs> when the All Blacks play their first test in 2024. So yes, we're looking a year in advance, but this is who Jeff has selected. Ethan De Groot, Samasoni Tokiaho and Tyrell Lomax make up his front row. In the second row, Scott Barrett and Tupo Va'i. Luke Jacobson at six, Sam Kane at seven, and Hoskins Satutu wearing the number eight jersey. Cortez Ratama at nine, Damian McKenzie gets the nod at 10 with no Re Richie Moonga or Bowden Barrett around. Geordie Barrett, Rico Ioane in the midfield and the back three of Leicester, Whainga Nuku, Mark Talia and Sean Stevenson. Before we let these guys rip into it, we're going to let Jeff defend his team himself. Well, just for Mills Muliaina, what I've done once again for the Form 15, I've changed the rules. So what are the rules this week? I'm picking the form players from this year's competition who we know are going to be available for Scott Robertson next, next year. So Mills, you'll be upset once again, but at the three key positions, I found it really, really tough. There's no Adi Savia in 2024. So on form this year, I'm going Hoskins Satuta. Now here's the big one. There's no Aaron Smith next year. There's no Brad Weber. So who am I going at halfback? Well, I'm looking at Cortez Ratama and thinking to myself, on this year's form, if he continues to play this well, I think he's an all-black in 2024. And then clearly, Sean Stevenson has been the standout performer in this year's Super Rugby competition. So with no Will Jordan on the field at the moment, I'm thinking to myself, he could be an All Black in 2024. You guys are going to debate and discuss. I'm not going to be there to defend myself, but give it a crack and see who you've got for Razor Robertson in 2024. <laughs> hey. Thank you very much, Jeff. I'm not sure if anyone can argue with the front row and second row, but if we take a look at the loose forwards, what do we think? Are we surprised with who he's selected? Of course, Adi Savia uh, will not be there. He'll be in Japan. Shannon Frizzell is also gone. Are we happy with these three? First of all, when he started that piece to camera, I'm sure there were some goalposts in the background and they moved as he was recording it. That's Jeff for you, moving the goalposts yeah. at all. <laughs> um, look, there's a name that... Firstly, uh, it was great to see Josh Lord back playing um, for the Chiefs and the Curtain Raiser. Um, and so hopefully he'll be back in the frame. Uh, very good prospect. The guy that, uh, to me, is a real up-and-comer, and I just love everything about his game, is Dom Gardner. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, either as a lock or as a, as, a, as a six, to me, he's got the potential to be both. Starting next year? Uh, he'll be in the frame, for sure, if he keeps going the way he is. Mills, what do you think? Yeah, I, man, isn't that exciting? Like, I mean, beside the fact that Goldie changes the criteria, <laughs> I'm wondering whether we even give it any time, because <laughs> next week will be something totally different, you know? So... <laughs> But when you look at those those guys that are staying, I know we talk a lot about the guys that are exiting. Man, yeah. there is some talent. And with this still, I mean, guys like Blackadder, you've got the halfback, halfback debate as halfback well. Halfback is very that interesting, is huge, isn't, it? isn't it? You mean you've got Fakatau, you've got Roy Guard, you've got Christie that's still there. I mean, you've got guys like Noah Hotham that are coming through too. So when we when you look at the team that Jeff's named, and then you think about the guys that are still coming through. Man, we've got some exciting talent coming through our ranks. Yeah, I like Hoskins at eight. I think Hoskins is our best number eight at the moment. You look at his stats in Super Rugby, he's really um, taken the opportunities he's been given this year. He knows there's a World Cup spot on the line. Um, but yeah, I think I think he's outstanding. He, he leads post-contact metres, um, and he's been having a field day at the scrum because of the new um, rule changes. Not so fun for the halfbacks to try to tackle him. Um, and then Blackadder would replace... Um, over Jacobson for sure. 
And then again, you've got to talk about the halfback. I really like Cam Bruegard. I'm a big fan of him. But TJ Pitanata, he hasn't said where he's going next year as well. And I do think, you know, prior to getting injured on the end of year tour, he was in some unreal form, you know, back to like when he was playing when he first started. So I think if he can bounce back from his injury, which is hard to do, you know, he's a bit long in the tooth now, you know, and so coming back from injury is a bit harder. Um, but yeah, I, I like that um, loose trio adding in Blackadder. I, I think the only thing would be, <clears throat> if we're a little bit short, Damien is the only is the only ten. Moonga going away. Pedro Oh no, Stephen Pedro Don't forget, yeah. don't forget Pedro Yeah, so I'll, I'll probably look at sort of key positions and where we've got sort of guys coming through. But man, we have again. I just can't get over the talent that we've. It's exciting. Seen. Oh, it's mm. exciting. When you're leaving Caleb Clark out and you've got Lester yeah, in there, absolutely. I know Will Jordan, uh, Jordan named that team either. Is is yeah? Jeff's left Will Jordan out there too, which <laughs> you know um, shows just how much thought he's put into this. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm only kidding. <laughs> Well, it's just he bagged mine, and I didn't get a chance to defend. Well, here you go, TJ. This is your <laughs> opinion. Get on, TJ. No, get on, no, no, no. Run. I, Look, I agree. I, I think that's an exciting-looking team. I've just got other names, like, you know, Will Jordan, yes. obviously. Stephen Pedalfetter, obviously. Mm. I just like... Um, as I say, I mentioned Gardner there yeah. before. But when you think it's going to be a bit of a new look to the coaching staff as well, and that's really exciting about this. It's the whole picture that's, you know, mm. chance to build something. It is. Uh, it's exciting for the future ahead, isn't it? Uh, we also wanted to talk about, uh, of course, there's going to be an exodus like there is after every Rugby World Cup, and a number of players have already said that they'll be going overseas. But what about the ones yet to sign? From what we're led to believe, uh, Rico Iwane has not yet signed a contract for next year. Leicester Whanganuku is in the same boat, and there's rumours that Roger Tuivasa-Sheik may even head across to Japan next year. Who is the most important signature? Oh, gee. Uh, I mean, if you, if you look at it from an experience point of view and where we sort of lack a bit of stock, it's probably have to be, you'd say, Rico. We can't lose him. We can't, yeah. because who, who else have we sort of, I mean, yeah. that's sort of coming through. We've, we've had a mountain of injuries yeah. in that position. You know, um, good Hugh, you know, we've got Anton Leder Brown sort of being out. Alex and Anka have always had great form. He's going overseas. So you'd have to say, you know, Rico Ioane. Whanganuku, he's been exceptional as well. He can probably slide in that centre too, so... But definitely for me, it'd have to be Rico, TJ. Yeah, couldn't agree more. If you got that spare $1.6 million, chuck some of it at him. <laughs> I think we're vulnerable in the midfield because if you look at the midfield pairing that he's named, Jordi Barrett, Rico Ioane, they're actually not midfielders when they started their professional careers. They're outsides who have been forced to go into the midfield because of the injuries or because we haven't had the depth that we had wanted. So. That's kind of concerning in itself that our main midfielders are actually outsides who have been converted to midfielders and we've got so many who are on the injured list. So yeah, I do yeah, think that we're going to have some issues in the future. Like, well, there's some good up-and-comers. Like, I like the way yeah. Billy Proctor's playing yeah, exactly. at the Hurricanes. To me, he's a guy who, who's shown that, you know, probably a natural 13 but can play 12. Billy's mm -hmm. coming on gangbusters. I like that. Um, uh, you know, I think there are there are options there, but mm. it always gets a bit scary. It's always such a big talking point yes. when mm. players leave. But mm. don't underestimate still the ability yeah. of New Zealand that, that, that oh, yeah. you know to keep producing remarkably talented young you rugby players. You talk about the 1.6 million in Australia, but we did, didn't we do a Silver Lake deal? So hopefully we've got a... <laughs> yeah. uh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully yeah. these players like a Billy Proctor stays in New Zealand. Yeah. Remember his brother went overseas after, what was it, one, one, one test, test cap yeah. for the All Blacks? So we want these players to stay here. Yeah, and, and I think, uh, I, I agree that Rico, I think, has to be, uh, you know, a, a priority. Well, one man who will be going overseas next year is Aaron Smith. He has been back in action for the Highlanders. And there's one thing that we need to mention. Uh, it was an incredibly emotional, uh, but also a very special match for the Highlanders. They were sporting different haircuts. All the forward pack shaved their heads, and that was for their teammate, Josh Dixon, whose brother is struggling with cancer right now. It was a gesture so that they know we're thinking of you, and they were sending their love out to this family. If you go on Give a Little, right there, there is the page you can support Josh Dixon, his brother Sam and their family who are going through an incredibly tough time at the moment. Brilliant. Yeah, wonderful. Um, as someone who's had a bit of a run in with the, the big C, I can tell you that that sort of love and support is what gets you through. Yeah. Thank you very much for sharing that as well. TJ, this is coming up this weekend. The Highlanders up against the Hurricanes. Yes, the Highlanders have won three on the bounce, but... They need to win against New Zealand sides, don't they? We'll talk about that very soon. But first, Aaron Smith joined a very elite club, just the fifth New Zealand player ever to play 350 first-class matches. Here is his happy place.
So my happy places on a rugby field. I pass the ball a lot in a game, but when I feel one come out of the screws and just absolutely rips and spirals perfectly, everything slows down and I watch it go all the way into their hands. Smith again goes wide, Hunt! And Mitch Hunt is through. And to me, that is what I do, that is my passion. And it's that little moment of grabbing the ball, spotting where I'm going and zinging it. Oh, it's my little happy place. Oh, back to his best for sure. Aaron Smith, big strike for the Highlanders. No, my hooky, my welcome back into the breakdown. Well, there is a big New Zealand derby coming up this weekend. The Highlanders uh, against the Hurricanes in Wellington. You've got an All Black against potentially an All Black in waiting. We were talking about players that could make the step up in 2024. Geordie Barrett taking on Thomas Uminga Jensen. Where do you see his future, Taylor? I loved the look of Thomas Umar Jensen. Like, he is such a big, powerful ball carrier. He's kind of that 12 that we've been missing. You know, ever since Nani Laumapi left, we've just missed someone who can just run it up the guts and get good gain line. Uh, he just has a fearless attitude, but he's also a good ball player. Like, he's light on his feet for such a big man. He ran past me at one of the games, and I thought it was a forward, and then I turned <laughs> around, it was actually Thomas Umar Jensen. You know, he's still in really good shape. He's got good acceleration. The only thing with him is he just keeps getting injured. You know, he was hitting his straps, I think, for Otago in the MPC last year. Then he got a groin injury and then he kind of had to come back and do rehab, um, playing for the Highlanders. But he's got a big future. So I think him against Geordie is going to be is phenomenal. Mm. Those course. early rounds, um, in particular for uh, Umanga Jensen, was quite significant because they were a team that was struggling. They didn't have any sort of wins. So um, when you see a guy sort of front up and get front foot ball, when you, particularly when your team's going backwards, that's when you know someone's uh, pretty special. Now he's actually getting a, a decent ride. But, Geordie, on the other hand, mm. he's, he, he, I mean, he loves the physicality too, and he's got a different sort of skill set as well, TJ. Yeah, good, good, good matchup. Um, his gain line stats, Umanga Jensen, are, are terrific, good as anyone, and it, oh, this is going to be a good clash. This, there's a couple of teams, you know, that the um, Highlanders are bouncing back nicely from a, a bad start. I, there's a lot to like about the way the Hurricanes have been playing this year. It's a good game, this. Yeah, another uh, bit of news that came out from the Hurricanes during the week for next year. They've signed Brad Shields, their former captain, who was there for the title, of course. That actually uh, breaks the drought, doesn't it, of players going overseas. He's come back after everything that happened uh, in club rugby with Wasp, and he brings back all that international experience. With no Adi Savir at the Hurricanes next year, they get stronger. Yeah, you lose a phenomenal player like Adi and everything that he means to that team. I think this is a great signing because he brings a lot of... You know, not just experience, he's still got plenty of power in his game. He's not arty, can't do all of those things, but he brings plenty. Well, let's talk about another report that is circling at the moment, and that is the potential switch of former Chiefs, former Wallabies mentor Dave Rennie to the Blues next year. If it is to happen, Mills, what would he take to that environment? Oh, it'd be, that'd be massive. It'd be strange. <laughs> It'd be a bit strange because maybe we had the Haka incident with Rico Ioani. So perhaps he signs, you know, Rico Ioani as well. But I love it. I love the fact that he's coming back. He's an exceptional coach. Um, yeah, and the way that sort of he was let go by, um, you know, Australian rugby is quite disappointing. But what he what he did with the Chiefs, you know, back to back champions. I mean, and so his experience is going to be huge. Bringing that sort of intellectual property uh, back to New Zealand, Taylor. Oh, and also such a, a big. Um I was going to say, load of mana. Like, you know, he, he carries so much mana and a lot of the players respect him and, um, you know, what he did with the Chiefs, but he's also gone and coached other teams as well. So he's got all that knowledge from then and they're bringing the international knowledge back into the game as well. And I think, like, the Blues... I do feel sorry for Leon McDonald because if they don't get a title this year, it's going to be hard for him because he, he has coached them well. They just haven't been executing it themselves. So can Dave Rennie just sharpen those skills a little bit more? I don't know. It would be Australia's loss our game. Mm. Yep. Yeah. Nice. Simple as that. Yep, nice. Nice, nicely said, TJ. Well, club rugby uh, has started in some parts of the country. It will start in other parts this weekend, but we've got a notice board for you. We're going to do this every week, bring you all the news out of our clubs across the country. Our first piece of news for you, Hamilton Maris. It is their centenary uh, this weekend, their centenary lunch. You can get tickets from their website above. Big game as well against Matamata this weekend. And TJ, you've got some club news for us too. Well, look, I just firstly, um, I hope it's a great weekend. 
weekend, I was at Marist, the, the, my great friend Kevin Hart passed away and they had the after match at the Marist Club. It's a great setup. But I, yeah, I just wanted to send a shout out to uh, the club that I, 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 I love, Waitohi and Picton. Tim O'Malley of Markle, he's going to be player coach this year and I know that the guys are really inspired to play well for Diane Ivamy, who's an old school friend of mine who passed away sadly last year, about the same time as my dad went. She held that club together for years and I know she is going to be the inspiration. So go the toys, do it for Di. For you two, what clubs are you supporting this year? I'm a spider life all day. Suburbs, hey. you used to play for Suburbs. I, I hope you still back there. Just about to give there. that <laughs> shout out to, to Suburbs. The under six Panthers and the under seven pa Panthers. Well, there's not under seven Panthers. Are you coaching? Or? No, I'm not, but no, I'll be down there Friday and Saturday morning. Is that a good thing morning. you're not coaching? Yeah, it is a good thing. It is a good thing. Yeah, Very good. And suburbs. go Tauranga Sports uh, in the Tauranga competition, Baywide competition as well. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you too uh, for joining us on the panel as well. And as always, Mills, brilliant. We'll see you on the break down back here same time next week. So